I've, I've actually, the last two speakers of uh, a lot of what I'm going to talk about actually cross cut so much of that. And I think there's the themes of around the sustainable development goals and about around resilience are just, you know, are, are kind of embedded in the way that we're working at the moment. Um, a little bit about uh, CRS, Catholic Relief Services. Uh, we're a, a, an international NGO going since the 1940s. Um, we're working in around 100 different countries at the moment. We generally work through our local partners and we're part of what they call the Caritas Network, which is the Catholic Church Network for social support. Um, and so uh, in the countries that we work in, we generally, gen uh, 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 generally work through our Caritas partners. And so in, uh, uh, in the uh, um, project we're doing in Myanmar, it's working with those, those partners. A little bit about the, uh, our, our journey towards sustainability. Um, I, I would say when I started with CRS, um, I came from a background um, as Deborah said, in, in this, in the, in the construction sector, where we were using BRIAM. I was one of the BRIAM, I used to be a BRIAM assessor and, and uh, designing projects around that. So it's very familiar with this kind of environmental framework, uh, sustainability framework. When I start talking about it within our sector, um, my bosses were pushing back and saying, we're, in the huma we're humanitarian, we are, we are in emergency response. You can't have sustainability in emergencies. By definition, it's not sustainable. You're actually just saving lives and getting people back on a pathway towards development. And it's in development that we see sustainability. But of course, after a disaster, the very next day when you pick up a brick or, you know, or start building a shelter or start doing anything, you're actually on your path towards your recovery and your recovery is taking you into your development. So you can't say, you can't separate it in that way and actually how you start people off is going to be actually how, you, how they finish up often. And so having putting people on a trajectory into a better place, more resilient, more, uh, a more sustainable future is really important. Without being too kind of doom and gloom, um, we have a huge challenge ahead of us at the moment. If we look at climate change, um, the displacement of people in the world at the moment, over 70 million refugees on the on the march at the moment. Most of those displaced for, for periods of 19 to 25 years, not including migration, not including population growth, all of these pressures building up. We just looked at our next 10 year strategy and said, what's the future for us? We're seeing nations uh, looking more inward, less assistance going out to help, uh, help other nations. And so we know that we're gonna have to be a future where we are going to have less resources and yet more work to do. And that means actually communities, countries, are going to have to be more self-reliant than they ever have been, which means we're going to have to change what we're doing and shift into a role where instead of just giving stuff, we actually have to partner with those communities and nations to be able to help them to meet the challenges that are ahead of them. So it's... it's, it's uh, I don't, I'm not sure it's a kind of bleak future, but it's certainly... A challenging future we're going to have to do things very differently so we do have within CRS within our development sector the development part of CRS we have this thing called the our integral human development framework which was which is a sustainability model but this was mainly used for development but we started looking at this and thinking well actually communities who are recovering after a disaster don't think in compartmentalised ways. They don't think about shelters and then water and then education. They have to think about all of these things together. And we have to think more holistically if our recovery for those communities are go is going to be more appropriate. So us, our, our um, sector is known as the shelter and settlement sector. But if you kind of analyse and look at some of those words, you know, shelter, do you live in a shelter? I don't live in a shelter. I live in a house, I live in a home. I don't live in a shelter. I put my bike in a shelter. I keep a cow in a shelter. But you don't, people don't live in shelters. And settlements don't actually describe us working and living together. So we want to shift the language of the whole sector, sector so that we are more integrated in our approaches, thinking more about the, not just about the, the hardware component of it, but also the social elements and the psychological components that make our home and our <coughs> communities. Because that way we're thinking, we're bringing in all of those softer elements into what, we're, into what we're doing. And when we actually look at, put homes and communities 
in the middle of our sustainability model, we then can start mapping out all the things that we need to achieve those, that environment that is going to allow people to survive, live and prosper and be more resilient for the future. And one thing about the, like the federation definition I think that's missing, I think, in that is that it picks up on resilience in terms of being absorptive and adaptive, but not trans so much transformative. And I think that is our new aspiration. How can we be transformative? How can we not just withstand the shocks that are hitting people, but actually, how can we actually change things so we reverse these things and make things better? And of course, we've got to have the sustainable development goals, haven't we? <laughs> so, um, so part of our journey of this is that we can take this theory, and when I presented it back to our bosses and saying, you know, this is the way we've got to think about these, these things, you can see their mind kind of spinning and the cogs turning, because how do you manage to think about all of these things at the same time in an emergency? It's really difficult. Somehow, you have to be thinking of that framework, pulling out the essential items, prioritizing those, get things going, and then start building and growing it back again. So there has to be a way to do that. So we did set out to look for kind of appropriate tools that we could, we could use to do that. Part of the background for um, the uh, QSAND and our, you know, the contact with CRS is Graham Saunders, um, who sadly passed away a couple of years ago, who was behind uh, the development of QSAND, also spent 13 years working for CRS and was his kind of lingering DNA in our, in our organization, I think, about these kind of more holistic approaches um, meant that th our convergence with QSAND seemed quite, quite natural. In fact, he grabbed me one day in a meeting and said, come and meet your tender at the time and talk about QSAND. So it, he actually brought this together on this. So we do find that there's a lot of synergy between this model and our, just quickly go back to it, our um, integral human <coughs> development model. It doesn't quite lay over the top, but it's, it's good enough. So we thought we should at least investigate it and see how we could use it. So in the, first, um, the first trial of using QSAND was in, in uh, Nepal after the earthquake. But it was some time after the earthquake. So we, um, uh, BRE were able to come and support us in reviewing our program design and to see how well we were aligned with kind of the QSAND, with, with QSAND and provide us a, a, a kind of scoring around it. They provided training um, for the whole sector and national level. And um, whilst it was really good for us, it was really useful, um, we had already set off on our journey in our program and it would have been, we knew it would have been better if we had married those things up a little bit at the beginning. Um, we also uh, did a desktop review of a project in, in, uh, in the Philippines. This was after uh, Typhoon Haiyan where a, a at-risk community um, were, were given the opportunity to relocate to a new, uh, to a new site and 900 families were going to move into this completely new development. And um, I thought that actually at that point, because of the, the type of development it was, I actually thought that a BRIAM tool would have been actually a, or, you know, almost a better tool to have used than QSAND. Um, but we, we looked at QSAND um, to be able to look at, uh, again, take a snapshot and a review of that program to see how well we were doing. But um, whilst we have these frameworks for assessment and evaluation, you know, how do we do this? How do we move forward? And, and uh, already you were uh, actually previously mentioning about kind of being more about, about community approaches. And I, I know David was talking about, you know, the, the participatory approaches. And, and these are well known. I mean, from the 70s and maybe before, but certainly since the 70s onwards, uh, participatory approaches for development have been, have been w well established and well documented. And there are, you know, we have a whole bunch of tools in CRS around our development work, which is based about community-based approaches. But in a, an emergency, these things take time. It can often take months sitting there with communities to come up with your plans and designs and things to actually get people on board. There is a, there's a certain amine, amount of uh, um, assimilation and, and, and orientation that has to be done. How do you do, manage that in an emergency? 
And often that is the reason why uh, humanitarian organizations say we can't do that, we just give stuff. And then that, all of that comes later. But we've been saying, actually, you can do it. You can actually, if you bring communities together quite rapidly, we can make, uh, we can make sets of decisions very rapidly together that at least provide the platform for community, uh, community to grow and um, the systems to grow. The other thing that we also have to think about is every household is different. Um, this idea that we give a package of assistance to people, well, obviously every household is different in terms of its makeup, its number, its capacities, and also the, the speed in which they um, respond and recover. You know, some households can get other things really quickly. They've got money in the bank. They've got friends. They've got relatives. They can do things where others are more vulnerable. So th the whole kind of, you know, it's a very messy environment we're working in. So how do we provide strength in community and provide a flexibility that allows, um, uh, allows choice for households to be able to respond in the way that they want? Um, so we had ideas of how we, we could do this. We wanted to kind of strip down some of our, our, our development approaches into a rapid approach that we could use within the emergency. And in the Rohingya response in, in Bangladesh, we had an opportunity to do this. So we have a, a million um, uh, Myanmar, uh, uh, Rohingya from Myanmar within two or three months that came across the border into Bangladesh. And they pretty much came with the clothes on their back, um, carrying their children and their old people and everybody there and they just had to start living in amongst this what was a bit of a, uh, a forest which is there isn't a forest now because it's all been cut down for firewood so and about a football field a day disappearing because of that so um, uh, we wanted to be able to work with this community who, who were kind of in shock and often um, the communities that were coming together didn't come together they were from different parts of Myanmar how could we build community how could we have them be the um, lead in the response. So with UNHCR, um, with our local partner Caritas, and with the support of uh, Oxford Brookes University, we looked at one area of the camp, which was for 200 households, and we wanted to see how we could improve the living conditions uh, through participatory approaches um, that would also kind of enhance and build the community. And in three months, through a process of doing some rapid planning, mapping, making a plan, implementing the program. Um, the whole site was redeveloped with uh, new shelters throughout, steps, drainage, water and sanitation, street lighting, kitchen gardens. Everything was done within three months. And that could only happen because the community were the drivers to do that. And we supported by partnering with them, by providing them the technical support that they needed and providing them access to resources to manage it. So we, we measured it. Um, we looked at the quality of the work, we looked at the cost benefits, and we particularly looked at the social benefits. And we found that actually at the end of it, when we were measuring, um, right at the beginning, we, were con we had control communities and the, con the community that we're looking at, is that we found that the community said that they felt safer, they felt more part of a community, um, that they, they felt stronger as a community. So this model seemed to, to work, and we developed a set of guidelines, which was very much around the steps that you're taking in, in a development process, but kind of stripped down for an emergent, for, you know, for, a, for an emergency context. And we shared that with the, uh, the sector in, in Cox Bazaar, and this has now been adopted by, um, by the sector there, and been rolled out. And, but we also shared it within our, our region between our partners, and in Myanmar, CS Myanmar said, um, we would really like to do that because our partners are involved in um, resettling people after conflict, but they're doing it old school. They are taking one-size-fits-all shelters, building them with contractors, and then they would ask people to come into their new homes and hand over the keys. Um, and then they were finding that people were really dissatisfied with the shelters that they were given, to the point that actually the last group of houses that they built people turned up to the site said thank you very much and then they took down the shelters and they rebuilt them again um, in the way that they wanted orientating them in the specific ways and everything so clearly they needed to do something and, and the organization were very mindful that they wanted to to, um, to improve upon this so we were asked to come and support uh, uh, CRS in Myanmar and their partner 
Just a little bit of background. Uh, internal conflicts within Myanmar. You've got after the independence, there's the, the separate states after a while looked for their own independence um, and have been in conflict with central government over that. It's resulted on, uh, in, in the border to, with China in the north, particularly in Kachin and the Shan states of, of a civil war that's going on, mainly fighting over minerals and teak and natural resources. But that conflict is going on. 100,000 people got moved and they crossed the border and they've been there for eight years. The government built camps for them, and the people are living in uh, barracks. I mean, literally, with you know, only about half the size of a stage would be for a family of five people. And then you've got the next people next door with a, a bamboo partition. And so they've been living without any privacy or dignity for five years in this condition. The government has said now that the conflict is dying down. People have an opportunity to go back. But some people can't go back. There's political reasons and, 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 and uh, there's issues with landmines and things where they can't go back. So they've decided to settle where they're staying. So KMSS, uh, which is the uh, Caritas within, within Myanmar, said they would like us to support with some training on community-based approaches. Um, and we, did, we developed a whole kind of strategy, which is going to be for the whole country. They're a huge organization. Um, but we said we'd learn by doing, by looking at opportunities to take a project and look and, and actually put it, um, uh, go through a, uh, the whole process of community-based approaches and provide training for um, people within that, their staff within that district and other districts to come in, uh, in uh, to support. We also then saw this as a, a, a great opportunity for us to be able to use QSAND right from the very beginning. But, but also to use it in a, a number of different ways. I mean, one is to use QSAN right to make that initial assessment to see if we can get the kind of you know, before and after uh, comparison so we can kind of score our performance as we're going, going through. It's, it's proved to be a really useful checklist for, for, uh, for, the, for the project to, to make sure that we're covering all the areas that we should be. Um, it's providing an overall benchmark, which I think is going to be really important because um, we have a... Uh, a, a project at the moment which we're calling Homes and Communities, which we are looking to try to advocate these approaches to our donors, to our larger partners, um, and we see this as an influence piece. If we, once we finish this, we get the project and we can, we can, we can demonstrate the efficacy of it, that we can, we can actually share it and influence it with others. So having a benchmark against it is really important. So. In terms of the assistance, uh, kind of aligning with those three pillars of sustainability, um, for we, we, we see these as essential components in all our programs now, is that we provide social technical assistance. Previously, we were just providing resources. Then we had this idea that we act, actually, we maybe need to accompany with a technical assistance. And, and actually, in Nepal, for the first three or four years, that was the package, technical assistance and resources, without the social assistance. And now they, they actually have this... Um, uh, uh, that there was a, a huge number of, of people who have not been able to move forward for social reasons. So you've got to have these three components. So in the social component, we're looking at um, community organisation. We're looking at uh, helping people to get their land rights, to be helping uh, registrations, being able to um, uh, sign their children up to, uh, to the schools and the clinics and things. So all of those components are in there. The technical is with the design, bills of quantities, helping with the monitoring of the of the, um, the building. And then for resources, increasingly now we're using cash. In fact, we're saying, you know, if, if we're not using cash, why not? Why are we not using cash? It's only we're not using cash when it, there is particular security reasons around it, because cash gives people choice. So progress to date. And in this pilot project, we have 48 households. The first 11, group of 11 households have come together to to, uh, to uh, move out of the camp. Um, I, I think this is such a kind of like an exciting opportunity for these people. You can imagine being in a camp for eight years. They have been regarded, because they've just been receiving AIDS, they've, 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 they've become, uh, been regarded locally as kind of feckless and dependent. And that is their, the, the attitude of not only um, the community that they live in, but also the organizations that were helping them. Suddenly, they've been given this opportunity to prove themselves in terms of being able to manage their own recovery. And you can imagine the excitement of being able to come out of a camp, build and design your own home with your community. It, it's it's uh, um, the, the, 
the motivation and enthusiasm is, is just incredible. So um, along with the dignity that you get through choice and the other things that you see on here, I think that one of the big changes that I would say, because this whole program was about capacity building for KMSS, when we did our first orientation with the KMS staff, they weren't convinced. They were not convinced about this before. They didn't think that people uh, could be trusted. They didn't think they had the technical ability. They didn't think they had any of these things, and they didn't really want to listen. And we had to kind of go through several steps and show them evidence that it could work. And a little went to the project now, and they are really enthusiastic and behind it because they can see the benefit. We've seen them shift now to become partners. They're not, they're not giving things. They're now partners with the community as they build. And, and that, I think, has been the biggest success so far in the project, and it's still ongoing. Um, what we hope to get from this is that, one, is it builds up the capacity of KMSS, but the other one is um, KM, uh, uh, Myanmar is what they're calling a, a localization pilot country. So it's, it's, it's supposed to be there to show, to demonstrate how if we shift resources to the local, uh, to the local capacity, it's a much more efficient and effective way of doing this. So we're feeding into that that kind of um, agenda and providing evidence for that. And I think it will, it's going to help the sector in Myanmar to, to, to move along that pathway. We'd like to see it roll out across Myanmar, but also that we will contribute to the <coughs> larger um, global agenda around this. And there's, you know, one of the things that we're working on, I can see Bill Flynn at the back here, you know, um, we, we've been working on a thing called promoting self-recovery, um, is recognising that in response to a tiny bit of resources that we ever have, you know, ever, ever helps around 10% of the people. And then you get this huge 80, 90% who have to recover on their own. How can we provide the demonstrations, the technical support that's going to help that group to be able to better recover and recover in a more resilient way? So there is a, uh, a whole paradigm shift within our, within our sector um, that. I think we can see is already merging with so many different and other initiatives. So it's really heartwarming to be here. And a big thank you to BRE for all your support. Thank you very much.